All right, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to right. hello. Fantasy Grounds Fridays. The one thing I didn't expect my phone's audio to be on <laughs> every time. Okay. Silence mine, just in case. Yeah, just just in, <laughs> as soon as we went live, it it popped up. I you like to keep it open as a as a third chat window, just in case. It's always surgical. Like it's like those things time themselves they, so perfectly to be like the second you've gone live, let's go. <laughs> I know every time. <laughs> anyway. Hello, welcome back to Fantasy Grounds Fridays. This is our weekly uh, talk show. We we talk all things TTRPGs, Fantasy Grounds, and whatever else topic comes up. Today, our very special guest is Logan Laidlaw from the Nat 19s. Hello, I'm Logan Laidlaw from the Nat 19s. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you said you it like, you're, like it's a political ad. Hello, I'm Logan Laidlaw from the Nat 19s, and I do approve of the rolling of dice, and I do not approve of critical successes on skill checks. See, I, I, you know what? We, we could have a full political debate on this, because I highly disagree. Well, that's, that's cool. You're cool that your table's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's technically... Here's the thing is that I know it's against the rules. I know the rules don't say that they work on them. Yeah. But it's cooler yeah. if they do. My my position is unfortunately mild. It's I don't like to run them uh, because I like the idea of skill checks and whatnot being what is within your abilities within your ability. Um, but I do get why some tables do it because some tables do just like the adrenaline rush of like, no, this succeeds automatically. It, Let's it go. is fun if like, you, you know, like I'm like, all right, but it's a DC 30. So they're like, yeah. well, OK, we realistically know we can't do it, but we're yeah, going to try. Yeah. The, the the PHB does recommend if something's going to have a DC of 30 or higher, it's just impossible. It, you don't roll for it. You just don't do it. Um, but, I you know, not. different tables like different things. I, I've i always been a fan of being like, no, I in the same way that I don't want a, a nat one on a skill check to meet a critical failure. Oh, no, I do that, too, because I think that's funny, too. <laughs> it, 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 it is funny. I, I think I, if you, <laughs> but if you, at least with my opinion, if you take critical successes, you have to also have critical failures. You can't do yes. one without the other. I agree. You can't do one without the other. I think that it's fair to do both, but you can't pick and choose which one because if if fate will bend around one five percent chance, it's gotta bend the other way too. It's always so like, shocking that it's only a five percent chance that it's a, a five percent chance type of thing. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, if you th if sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say. Anyway, do you want to introduce yourself since we've been rambling about <laughs> critical skill checks? Uh, yeah. Um. Uh, since I sent my message out late, but you guys probably don't know me. I'm Logan Laidlaw. I'm the creative director of Nat 19, which is a uh, actual play show that plays pretty much exclusively 5e. Uh, technically, now we're playing 5.19th e because we're sort of developing setting guides around a uh, our own edition uh, to add on to D and D. Did you just say 5.19? Yeah, five, I think that's really we call clever. It, we call it 19th edition or 5.19th. All right. Um, heck in. Um, what else is there too? I'm also a voice actor and uh, for animation, commercials, and video games. Uh, and I am also an internet face that you that does slash did abridging stuff, but that's very separate from the identity that's going to be present here today. I think. Um, uh, yeah, I don't really know what else to. Yeah, we're we're a five E actual play. We've been going for about seven years. Uh, we wow, seven years is a long time. Yeah, it's crazy to think about how long Nat 19's been going on. And I've been playing D&D, &D, playing, since <laughs> I was about 12. Although I don't know if I'd say I was actually playing D&D &D well, as think, much I as think that's, gesturing that's in the go. direction of D&D. &D. That's where I was going to go with our, our first question is just a, a nice little easy one for you before we get into the real tough journalism that we're about to get into is <laughs> uh, <laughs> what got you into role playing games? Uh, so technically what got me into role playing games when I was really, really young is I have uh, an older half brother who got estranged from his D&D group and really wanted to recapture the magic of it. So he grabbed me and a bunch of my friends who were all like six years younger than him. He's like, I'm going to play for you guys so I can self insert my own old characters and have them be super cool and whatnot. But uh, I got pretty quickly enchanted. It was just like back in the 3.5 days. Mm -hmm. I got pretty quickly enchanted with just the mechanics of the game and rolling for things and the agency that you're afforded by make believe. And I always had a very active imagination as a child. Uh, so I kind of fell in love with the idea of dice play, uh, based role playing games, even though I wasn't really playing D and D right, you know, for whatever that means. 
Um, and uh, it, I then spent like the next eight or nine years trying to kind of recreate the magic by making up my own games to avoid learning complicated rules. Uh, basic things. I think we've all done that at some point being like, yeah, no, you got six stats and hit points and mana and everything. We'll figure it out as we go. Here's a D20. Roll it. <laughs> I can say I <laughs> haven't actually done that, but I am a big proponent of if the rules are too complicated that it slows down the game, ignore them. Yeah, no, there's so many. It can be fun to engage in complicated rules, mm -hmm. but if if it takes away from the fun too much, you should definitely put it to the side and revisit it later. Uh, and yeah, and uh, I got into properly playing more about a decade ago when I started getting interested in running streams and whatnot. Um, and Nat19 sort of became, was born from me trying to, give myself like anchor myself to being like okay here's a group of people we're on camera they have to show up every week let's go uh and i got back into it and um i never thought i'd be writing D, &D stuff but it, it went that way uh but yeah i, I got into it mostly because my brother wanted to live vicariously through me and i took over <laughs> that <laughs> and for then myself. you you fully ran with it until the end yep yep, yep. i love it i love it. that's Honestly, not too dissimilar, but mine was was my dad. He was like, here's Dungeons and Dragons. I used to play this when I was a kid, and it was second edition. Oh, um, second edition. And then, yeah, that was that was where I started, was 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 learning Thacko at 10 years old. Oh, I hate Thacko <laughs> so much. I get why they did it for the, the age, for the age of tables and number crunching I, and reference you know, sheets. And I think that's where my love for tables come from. Even though I just said ignore complicated rules i still love a good just book full of tables i love a good table um I, I i don't like i think hundred entry wild surge tables are fun i think thousand entry are bad that's a, little <laughs> bit too a much. limit that's too much yeah. but what if you have a 100 entry table that goes to another each one its own 100 entry wild surge table that is so you'd have to be using a VTT. Yes, I don't, you couldn't VTT, do that at a table. Yeah, no, you, you'd end up having just the wild surge binder on the side. But uh, I, I love stuff like that. I think tables, it's actually kind of appropriate for the stream we're doing. Table lovers benefit from VTTs because they can be so seamlessly built into just clicking a button as opposed yeah. to referencing and like well, and with, out papers. Just to, to shout it out, since we're, we're doing the show for Fantasy Grounds, we are, I am, hello, Fantasy Grounds. Uh, <laughs> one of the fun things is that you can build your tables to link to other tables that will then roll immediately. So you really could build a 100 uh, entry long wild search table that each leads to its own 100 entry long wild search table. Yep, yep, and it would be seamless and you just go and it would just give you the result for the whole thing immediately without any paper shuffling. I, I use complex table structures actually to uh, do random encounters in a oh, bit of okay. a, in, in our last um, in our last campaign, the Cauldron campaign, the finale of campaign one of uh, of Nat 19's Vestige of a Fucus campaign. Uh, I had a lot of time to prep, so I built a complex series of encounter tables that were like stripped down into like six environmental encounters six enemy faction encounters six uh weather encounters mm. and stuff like that and i just had it all set up so i basically just hit a table to roll a d4 it would figure out which one we had to do it would go to it it would roll it and it was about 50 options for each like biome effectively of the map and once i had it set i was like cool this is good if i was at a table this would be way too much to keep track of I like yeah you uh, honestly i don't yeah. know i mean like you could do it i'm sure there are people that do uh probably people that play like games like Rollmaster that are just massive amounts of, of tables and percentiles and numbers um and that's definitely like a, a genre of things people like yeah yeah i and i really like i said i love a good table i think the main thing is especially because we run a show mm -hmm. if it if we have to stop to do anything for more than four minutes I want to shorten it down, you know, yeah. uh, especially if it's going to be something as frequent as encounter tables. Yes. But uh, yeah, love, love me a good table. I also come from the age of like DCC. Do you know DCC Dungeon Crawl Classics? Yeah. I have a love hate relationship with like their spells because of how ro rolling a spell is such an event 
where you have you don't just have I do my spell, I have a result. You have I roll my spell, I roll to see a result. I have like ten options I could choose, and a couple I might be forced to choose that would be bad. It's so time consuming, but my brain is like, I love that. Yeah, but I, I, but I get to so roll much. a bunch of shiny rocks. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's it's great. It's it's controlled chaos. It and is it's so good. Um. Yeah. Well. Anyway. Uh. Before we get too far. Uh. Deep into this, I want to just do a huge shout out to everyone that has followed and subscribed. Uh. Usually, I would try to. Uh. Get everyone's name read off, but it's been so many over the past. Uh. Ten minutes. I don't know if I can get to all of you. So thank you all. You're all appreciated. Um. And stick around. We've got lots of cool shows coming up in the future too. So. Um, and also there was a hype train going. I can't tell if it's still going because the screen, uh, for the hype train has just turned black. So I don't know what that means, but <laughs> oh, if like it is still going, too. keep it, keep it going. You get some free emotes. I just see a white bar with a bunch of emojis bouncing up on top of it. Yeah. Oh, there it is. It's a level three hype train. I can see it on my phone. This is why I have three different versions of chat open. Nice. Cool. <laughs> um, but anyway, I guess what, since we, we talked about what got you into RPGs, what kind of led into, uh, streaming and content creation for you? What what drove you to that path? So initially, I grew up kind of with the opinion of like, I probably don't have the sharpened skills necessary to write content. Um, so I played very loose with it. That came a lot later. What made me want to stream is, I mentioned that my background in performance is like a bridging, so like anime parodies. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do a Type Moon Fate, like Fate Stay Night based campaign, uh, which we ran. Uh, and I wanted to get a bunch of fate content creators involved in it. And I got them mm. in. They didn't all stay in it hilariously, but uh, because they died or had things to do or they died, they died mostly. Uh, but uh, streaming, that was kind of what started things going. And then that snowballed into a Digimon campaign. And I was sort of stuck in this. I use other properties mm. to run stuff because I run stuff that makes my brain buzz. And then same. Yeah. Right. Mid Digimon. There's, there's just been a setting. We all have like an idea for a setting that's just been in our heads since we were kids and is morphing and changing over the past like decade or so. I've been actually trying to refine and craft down a setting called Somnus Domina. Uh, and I decided to actually try to nail it down. And when we started vestige, I was like, I'm going to try to have this be the medium that this takes shape in. And I was going to kind of just softball it at first. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was going to try to be like, ah, you could think of it as the Forgotten Realms, but it's it's our but own different. stuff. We got our own gods. Yeah. And then it sort of really took over the setting. And as we wrote more, we developed an audience that was very interested, um, which was optimal, in the setting. And every time lore stuff that was non-Forgotten Realms based would drop, we'd basically develop like a conspiracy theory sector of our fan base that would like go off on it and i realized there was such a high demand for like the lore of it that i was like i'm gonna gamble on spending more of my energy than i was comfortable with actually trying to make this come mm -hmm. to life um and that at first i was just making a couple races uh here and there the Cassadria, the the shape-shifting fox people but not the sword saint class uh and you can find all that stuff by in the chat by the way sorry plug Logan no, go Laidlaw ahead. Please on, plug your stuff. Logan Laidlaw on Drive Through RPG. Also, Nat19 on Twitch. Nat19show.com is our website. Um, I initially was making just small things and then slowly started making bigger things. And as of this year, we did our Kickstarter and we're making uh, two books now, one of which is almost 700 pages as a setting guide. And the other one, which is the best year in GM Tools, is going to be like 400 pages. <laughs> so the, that, Those are some big books. <laughs> they are. It was supposed to be one book at about 500 pages. And um, you're like, no, nah, what if instead we split it into two books and it's more pages? Yeah. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> whoopsie doopsie. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's hard for me to think of the milestones where things escalated. Mm -hmm. But we started basically just because I wanted a, an excuse to get people together to run a fate thing. And then it transitioned into wish fulfillment and me getting to turn this thing in my head into something that people want to play in. Yeah. And that's super cool. The idea that other people in the world want to play in the setting we made and probably change it to their own, you know, accords as they should. But that is wild to me and so flattering. Yeah. Um, and I'm so excited. And every time someone tells me about how it's going at their table with our content, I'm like, please, I'm like a child. <laughs> I want to know. 
<laughs> tell me a story of what you've done. But, yeah. Uh, so I guess what what is that what is that like? Like having people tell you like, yeah, I'm playing my own D and D games in your world. <sighs> Usually, there's some merge between like the thing they want to do and what our content is because that's mm -hmm. usually it's like yeah it's our setting but we brought in your pantheon and whatnot because rarely does a table fully play another setting even with critical role usually you know Teldore stuff usually ends up being it's Teldore but also Aberon um, <laughs> what a cool but, combination though it would be I agree <laughs> but when people tell me about it and tell me about playing it and like using the gods and whatnot um it's surreal because again i never when i began this i never had the confidence to think like oh these ideas in my head are going to be more than just a picture show that plays when i listen to music mm -hmm. um it, it's crazy to think and I, I love hearing about how people take the concepts as a whole that i do and how they interpret them and twist them and how they like create their own versions of them because that's really what dnd is to me ultimately is here's a set of things you can do what will what will you do is all role-playing games to me um, I, I think that's a really good like way to to succinct it down into into a single sentence. Yeah. So it's flattering. I'm all, I always have this dichotomy of being like, tell me what you did so I can mechanically analyze it, so I can figure out how to better make stuff in the future, mm -hmm. and also, but also trying to be like, I don't want to be overwhelming, and I want to keep my hands off because I want you to have fun the way you're having fun. Yeah. So you know what and I you mean. You don't want to micromanage everybody that bought your book. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's kind of like the thing we mentioned earlier when like we'll have a if, if a feature pops up in a piece of my like one of my subclasses that talks about like if you roll a 20 on a strength uh, mm -hmm. a, a score, you it, you're treated as an automatic success. There have been people it, that's not an exact case, but people have been like, yeah. well, that already is the case. And I'm like, mm, it's not according to the rule. And I write to the rules. Yeah. But, you know, and it's like, I don't want to tell you how to run your thing. However, this was made this way. So you know um but no it's it's mind-blowing and the past year has been oh i just i am still emotionally catching up with the kickstarter if i'm gonna yeah, be honest with you I, I could imagine yeah it was um i don't know sorry could, please feel free to i was continue. gonna say it's been four months but i think that the actual weight of that kickstarter has been suppressed under the constant uh production <laughs> pipeline of actually making the book uh a lot of art mm -hmm. is the main thing. Constant writing art breakdowns. Yeah. I have a feeling when that thing comes out, I'm going to just fall on the floor and cry. I think that's <laughs> what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yes, I can, I can absolutely imagine that's uh, a, a, a heavy, heavy weight. Um, and, and also just <sighs> incredibly amazing at the same time. Yep. It's um, uh, it is. Before we continue, I want to, I want to mention to everybody um, looks like my Discord's uh, video is slowing down. That sometimes happens, but it should only affect you, uh, Logan, and the stream. You're a bit fine. choppy, but whatever. Yeah. That's fine. But it looks fine on stream, so that's what matters. Uh, but anyway, um, I want to mention to everybody watching, uh, feel free to ask questions. The chat's moving a little fast, so if you just post it in chat, I might miss it. I'm going to try my hardest, but it might get missed. But if you're watching on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash fantasygrounds. Down at the bottom of the screen, there's a little D20 icon. If you click on that, it opens up a sub window. Inside, there's a button that says Ask a Question. You can click on that, type in your question. goes into a queue right here, so I can't miss it. Um, so feel free to uh, drop in questions if you have any questions. Um, and then one thing I want to bring up, not a question, more of a comment, uh, but Fantasy Grounds Derek, who is one of our customer support people, says, Hello, Logan. Mm. Um, I know he's been Hi, working Derek. with you. <laughs> hello derek um very nice to hear from you derek hi derek <laughs> <laughs> um derek also does all of our uh wiki documentation so uh, oh you yeah, saved huge, my life huge thanks to him you saved my life on more than one occasion i have a button on my stream deck that just opens the uh like syntax and coding page of the wiki because i need to review it all the time yes so same. thank you derek you're my hero <laughs> Yes, we, we all love we all love Derek. Uh, but yeah, so feel free to ask your questions. Uh, we'll try to get to all of them, but show's only an hour, so who knows if we will, but we'll try our hardest. Um, oh man, I had a question right before we went to this, and then it uh, uh, derailed out of my brain. Oh, I'm um, so sorry. 
I'm a rambly little guy. I know. Where it wasn't you. It was uh it was the doing the plug for chat that kind of threw me off. Um well Derek says if you have uh, suggestions for improvements, please feel free to ping him and uh about the wiki or about coding. <laughs> I think probably about the wiki. Okay. Uh, but if you do have if if you do have any uh, suggestions about the coding, feel free to send that over to us cuz our our developers are always uh listening. I have some genuine uh, recommendations that Fantasy Grounds could, I think, pretty easily implement that would be super good for third-party developers. I don't know if I should talk about them here because I don't know if that creates undue pressure. But yeah, I do probably have some not, things. It's probably not the right place here. But yeah, if you want to yeah. send those over... Uh, I would love to. Uh, you could probably send them over in a support ticket and we can forward those on to the people that uh, need it. Yeah. Uh, but then I, can... I guess... Thank you for reminding me. Uh, I remember what the question was, and it was... Uh, because you use Fantasy Grounds for your streams, uh, what kind of what kind of brought you into using uh, Fantasy Grounds for that? So initially, for like the first two to five, I don't quite remember sessions of Solar Shadow, our fake game, we just used Tabletop Simulator, and that was fine. It was fun. Tabletop Simulator offers a nice little toolkit to like build houses and dungeons, and I'm sure it's gotten better since I stopped using it too. But uh, there is like a kids playing with their building blocks sort of feeling to using the tabletop simulator mm -hmm. that I was like, I don't super love this. Um, and I went searching for different VTTs. I wasn't really familiar with VTTs at the time. I'd never used them. And um, basically I landed on, uh, and not to, not to cause any you know rivalry conversations here, but uh, Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds were the ones that really came up. Uh, and Fantasy Grounds, the it just seemed more refined. It had a UI that stuck with me more. It definitely took me a while before I really learned to use it. But and, and that's, I feel like that's what a lot of people do. But once you, once you really get into it, you realize like there's a lot of power behind it. Yeah. Even back then, um, the way that it handles coding and the things that it can automatically parse out, uh, were super useful once I learned to use them for a while. I was kind of, I didn't know how to program things to even have an attack populate properly on an NPC sheet, for example. But I, so, so I was sort of just using it as the uh, uh, advanced note taking mm -hmm. my brain got ahead of my mouth. Um, and then over time, as I learned to use it, and especially once I discovered the extension community, which is in my opinion, kind of the big draw <laughs> of fantasy grounds, I realized how versatile it can be and how much it can automate without you losing control yeah. entirely. Because automation for automation's hard for TTRPGs because yes. uh, if you automate too much, you start to lose the micro decisions that often have mm -hmm. to happen, like mid roll, mid attack. Yeah, whatever. then it turns into a video game, and then it turns into you yeah. playing something like Baldur's Gate, which is amazing and fun and the best game ever made. But a different uh, medium. But it's a different it's a different thing. It's no longer yeah. a TTRPG. And so we stuck with that, and I really like the image tools, the mapping tools. Uh, just in general, the presentation of the program was really mm -hmm. good, and I found I got to get to know it very well. And maybe it's just that I have a very list and... Uh, a list of driven brain, I guess I'll say it. But when I discovered the coding again, Derek, don't know how long you've been at it, but thanks. When I discovered the wiki and I just found the guide on how to like properly code it, just, I was just like, that's it. I'm, I'm married to this program. <laughs> uh, I have, I have stepped into others cause I want to learn about others since then. But just every time I keep coming back out of familiarity and love for fantasy grounds. Yeah. And its community is great. Uh, the people that make its extensions are amazing. Oh, yes. Um, yes, absolutely. All of the Mad Nomad extensions and uh, the like constitutional amendments and uh, better combat effects and better combat effects gold. Mm -hmm. Like all those, I'm like, Fantasy Grounds is already great. But those make it like so versatile and so useful if you're willing to put the time in to learn it. Um, the, I, I could I could just name off extensions. I won't, yeah. but I could just name a list. I've I've got too many installed, but um, it's so good and it's malleable, mm -hmm. and it seems like the developers relatively listen. Um, I yeah, we do. Really... We we try. Yeah. the The thing is, is that it's you know, especially with like you you kind of brought it up, uh, and that's the the thing that is the hardest part of working on a VTT is how much automation do you give before it's too much? 
Yeah. So there's there's all there's tons of people who are like, I want everything fully automated. I don't want to have to do anything. Yeah. And then there's people who want to do everything by themselves manually. And what is like what is the the balance between those two? And that's the the hardest part to find. Yeah. Like not not to um say that I don't like D and D Beyond because uh, that, that would be untrue i played with it at tables it's great it's really good as a table reference i think is its strength but like for example the way that um D beyond is very locked into make your thing we'll calculate everything if it's programmed right and mm -hmm. there's not really a lot of room on there to easily modify things there's room just not a lot of room and it's hard to find like that's a case i think of it being like a bit strict it doesn't really give you uh on the fly um modification that i think is really important i like i played with a bunch of new people at a table um and they all used it and they were all super confused by it and i was like that's a kind of a sign i think that it's mm -hmm. hard to access it but uh, um then i got one more question here about fantasy grounds and it's have you checked out any of our brand new features that kind of just released uh, a couple of weeks ago so as of the last update basically yes um the last major i update. So, I mean, the big one to talk about, right, is the 3D camera yeah. view, uh, which is amazing. And most of our players on Nat19 are in love with it. We had one who was, um, what was it? I like using it when I've GM'd with it so far. I mm -hmm. like using it just in general because uh, it helps with immersion. Is yes, my main absolutely. Thing. And especially because you, you already have all your full character art for all your characters anyway. Yeah. Uh, we... We are so invested in art that all it does is help us to really push that mm -hmm. um, because we're up. For those of you that don't know us at home, we are probably the most art driven D&D uh, &D show probably Absolutely. on the Internet. Like, and there's no, no question effectively. I think that's what makes you stand out, though. So that's a that's a real good niche to have. Big part of our brand. Um, so we have so many assets. So when you guys added that and we could have the full tokens, we haven't gotten into it yet, but because you get the full character tokens in the 3D view. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, for example, for our upcoming Gilligan's Grave campaign, starting in late May, go check it out on the channel. It's in Somnus Domina, but you don't need to see our other content to know what how to we know what it is. So chat's over here. That's why I'm pointing. Go go see that <laughs> chat. Um, I, I decided to be like, okay, I'm going to size all the tokens so they are like height accurate mm -hmm. uh, in the five foot space to each other because I think stuff like that's super cool it if you cool. have time um and it's great i think that one thing that the 3d view really imparts that token view doesn't mm -hmm. is scale because yes. when you see a five foot you know circular token of a medium creature and then one of a large creature you're like okay it takes up space it's big but when you switch to the 3d token view and you get this more uh like uh three-dimensional view of exactly how big it is it reminds you how huge some creatures actually yeah, you, when are you look that, at a dragon in that you're like oh yeah oh, i get it now you and I, it's also got things like it, when someone would fire a longbow shot passed on their token and i as a gm would be like okay well the thing you're shooting at is going to have like half cover they'd be like are you sure about that all that's in my way is one thing with the 3d view it's a lot easier to be like okay i want you to look get on the same level as your character and look well, at can, it if you haven't <laughs> clicked it now there's a first person uh, button that will I lock haven't, it. It will lock your, done, your view to whatever token you have selected. If you're a player, it will lock it to your player's token. So you're really? seeing oh. exactly what would be in their vision. Honestly, really, really great for line of for actually getting line of sight calculations. I might recommend people do that when they do that. I knew that existed, but I've been so enamored with just the 3D view. Yeah, yeah well, and it feels like it's actually it like a much. table with like little minis on it. It's really fun. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really good for being like, yeah, that huge, that large creature that's in your way. Can you see like in this view why you can't see the tiny creature that's behind it? Like, yeah, it, it helps to contextualize. Mm -hmm. um, I like the I, we found out recently that resizing images is good. Kudos to you guys. I saw that you got added an option to change the, the sizing arrows mm -hmm. between whichever version you want. I'm really happy you guys gave people the option to do that. Um, yeah, no, the. I know you guys also added support for animated tokens and whatnot. We haven't done that yet, but I think it's super cool. Yes. And I, when I figure out how to do it, I want to spend more time. Animated tokens, at that. though, it's like a that's a whole other level of uh, development and resource. Just because instead of having one token image, now each token has to have like 
30 different versions of it so that it plays yeah. back at, yeah, a, at I... a reasonable pace. All right, we got some questions, though, I'd like to throw your way from chat. All right, let's, let's go. Uh, from the Raven Den, uh, what was the inciting moment when you knew that Vestige and uh, Samus Domina and Nat19 uh, as a whole was something that you knew was going to be uh, or something that you knew was going to be um, a thing. Uh, did you have a roadmap uh, or was it fly by the seat of your pants situation? So like I'm interpreting that question as like, when did we know that it was going to be bigger than just a casual thing we were doing? Yeah. At the table? Yeah. Basically that, that's um, kind of how I, I took it too. If, uh, if that's a wrong interpretation, uh, Raven Den, please let us know. But that's, there's that's a few, there's a few data points I'd say that kind of came together. It's when, first of all, from a financial point of view, it's when a bunch of our, I think it's when our stuff started hitting like uh, platinum on drive through RPG. And I was like, Oh, people want this stuff again. Not, not bringing that up to be arrogant. Also hashtag humble brag though. Um, heck in, That's pretty but amazing. Also, it, it was just an indication that like a lot of people are buying this stuff because they like the flavor of the content, I think. Um, and that was an indication that, you know, financially, that we could keep going with it. Uh, but I think when we released Lushu's Guide to Kitsadria, which is a 130 page book available on Drive RPG that is specifically about the Kitsadrian race, and it's a uh, class options, subclass options, bestiary, history of the race, um, and a chunk of history from Somnus Domina included, that sold really well. And a lot of people pushed to get, to, to get that. And the interest in that book. I think is what made me be like, people want the setting mm -hmm. as the setting as more than just, uh, here's some fun things to play with. That told me people wanted to know about the setting and the lore and the gods and had an interest in playing in it, not mm -hmm. just with it. And I think that's probably where I was like, cool. Then my, again, I mentioned abridging. Um, I love abridging. I'm going to keep doing it until my agent tells me I can't anymore because <laughs> of reasons. Uh, they haven't done that, but I suspect one day they might. Um, I kind of am like Nat 19 is now my exit strategy from that section of what I used to do. I am willing to bet on this being the future mm -hmm. and all of the team members have been super supportive and they all want to, to ride or die with that as well, which is a great feeling. Um, but yeah, I would say it's Lucius Guide to Kitsadria, as well as I really turned hard into, I know that people that don't know Nat 19, this won't mean anything to them, the Honokuni arc of Vestige, uh, which was basically a Gaelic Asian-themed Curse of Strahd, is like the, okay. the most basic way to say that. It was a yeah, dreadful okay. sort of situation. Um it was a very contained arc that I was like, I really want to inundate this, which is with as much personality that's not tied to the Forgotten lore or, uh, realms as possible. Mm -hmm. See how it goes. And by the end of it, people seem to be, th feel it was the like strongest arc of Vestige. And I was like, that tells me I should continue to focus on our content and not focus on the gradient between it and the Forgotten Realms. And then wizards did some not great business things. And we were like, you know what we'd like to do? Not have any of their intellectual material in our stuff. And then we started renaming things and made it all entirely unique. Um, cause of the OGL debacle basically. Um, so yeah, those, those combination of things were kind of where I was like, this is something we want to push forward. Mm -hmm. We're going to, we're going to bet on a Kickstarter. That'll basically determine the future of the brand. And it did. And it, did super well and raised over 200,000 Canadian. And I was like, that's a solid indication. I that think is, that let's is, let's keep going. There with you this. go. That's right there. Um, and then I've got another question. This one's from, uh, I'm might butcher your username. So I apologize up front. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kroger studios, Kroger studios. I hope I'm, hope I'm getting that right. But, uh, do you have any recommendations for growing an actual play channel? okay uh consistency so especially when you're starting out um care about the baseline level of quality never sacrifice fun obviously mm -hmm. but uh make sure that you're streaming on a consistent basis so people always know where to come and where they can find you um figure out what you're good at and don't don't push it in a like a 
surgical sense, but like try to try to focus on the things you do well. For example, we had the budget coming into this to get a lot of art made. And our art, I think, was our entry point to helping people visually understand our brand. Mm -hmm. So like the the amount of art and the character designs, I think they evoked thought in our viewers and they helped us they helped shape their perception of it, which led us kind of opened a door to us being like, here's some broader ideas. And it it helped us evolve. Um, so we focused on that. I'm not saying focus on art, but that's an asset that we had and we steered really hard into it. Um, mm, always reflect on yourself because it's an oversaturated market. It's just true. Yes. There's a lot of actual plays and basically anybody can start one. So really focus on what can we do? Not, not different special, but what can we do that is just us? What energy do we have? Like, what are we good at? Don't don't focus on things that focus on things that are fun if you want to just have fun. But if you're trying to grow a brand, uh, make it something that you're good enough at that people can at a glance be like, I can tell this this is here. I can tell mm -hmm. that this is in place. Um, because sometimes you do have to sort of you you do have to. What was the phrase we used to use about writing? You have to kill the baby. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you have to, you have to, and that's that's like a actually a really really common uh, turn of phrase for for writers and and people yeah. in the the film industry and and all of that. Um, yep. You 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 have to you have to kill your babies. Yep, it's sad but true. You can't do everything you want to do, and not yep. everything you want to do is going to work. It's yeah, well, and just, just just the, the, even the the things that you might think are really cool, if they're not showing that other people are interested in it, then. It's There's time a, to pivot to the things that they are interested in. Yep. And I think it's important to have a table in D and D. I think it's really important to have a table of people who are on board. Uh, they trust whoever the creative director and GMs are so that, cause usually the creative directors and GMs are kind of the people who are going to steer the brand really. Cause most of the brand is coming out of their head. Mm -hmm. Um, there has to be a strong trust for those people that they will take it down a path that's good and the players have to steer into it because I think when it comes to D&D &D brands, um, they ride or die based on how interested the players are in mm -hmm. their own game. Uh, so make sure you don't have a table who's just showing up to have fun. Like, they should show up to have fun. Yes. But make sure that you have a table that is showing up because they believe in the table. Mm -hmm. Um all of our players are good for this, but a really good example of this, and I see you in chat, uh, is Hayden. Hayden, their interest in our setting and our table and in Somnus Domina uh, and their questions about it mm -hmm. and their love for it has helped me to remain confident and grow ideas because they, it shows me where interest is and it makes me feel like there's a point, you know? Uh, and that's really important. And I guess the, I guess the basic form of what I just said is um, make sure out the core members of your brand all support each other. That's yeah. really, yeah, yeah. That's uh, the most important part. Don't and don't just show up. Everybody involved in it, don't just show up to do a job. Like, think about mm -hmm. what you can do. Everyone's got to try hard because, and this is an archaic idea, but it's true. You have to try hard because there's someone out there probably trying harder than you. Th there, uh, there's no a, matter how hard you're trying, somebody else is trying harder. So you, you, you won't be the hardest worker ever. That's just true. But hopefully in conjunction with everything else going right, you can put in as much effort as is needed to help it ex what you're doing excel. Um, yeah. If you only do what you have to do, you won't. It's just the reality of the thing. Uh, yes, yes, Drake takes. It takes a village to run a stream. It does. It, it absolutely, absolutely does. does. I'd, be, we'd, I'd be nowhere without... Uh, Hayden to manage our uh, shop and our wits and crits and our peripheral mm -hmm. streams. Uh, heckin, I would be nowhere without our artists doing all the heavy lifting and me being like, here's a two sentence description of a character and then the character. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it, uh, I, people tend to focus on the GM, which mm -hmm. is fair, but like, you know, critical role would still be great, but wouldn't be what it was if it was just Matt with a oh, bunch absolutely. of pretty good players. Absolutely. It's it's great because everybody involved is great and always brings 100%. So I guess that's that's the sum up of this. Bring it really bring 100%. Is. Everybody have a vision, be unified, want to make something you're good at and everybody be there to do it. That's mm -hmm. that's I guess really the advice.
and hope for good luck because you will need good luck. Yes, so luck. there's a as with all role playing games, a heaping dose of luck is always required. Yep. Uh, so true. I do want to mention, since it was brought up, anybody that does stream and uses Fantasy Grounds, make sure you reach out to Belmarte66 on Twitch or at Fantasy Grounds 2 on Twitter slash X, whatever you guys want to call it. Uh, but reach out to us and uh, let us know. We'll get you on the, the list. We regularly uh, share our streamers on our uh, weekly newsletter as well as retweet your stuff and all of that. Um, and yeah, remember to be tagging on Twitter at Fantasy Grounds too, um, for reasons. For but reasons. Yeah, for reasons. But yes, <laughs> make, make sure make sure you're tagging at Fantasy Grounds too, and not just hashtag Fantasy Grounds. That way we we see it. Um, it could take weeks before we see uh, you know a hashtag Fantasy Grounds. But if you're doing, if you're directly tagging us, we'll see it right away. Can attest. They they've been responding to our our tags for years, so. Yep, that's that's how it goes. Anyway, yep. um, still related to uh, growing a, a stream or uh, a content creation, um, how long did you use uh, Fantasy Round before it went from a, a hobby stream uh, to almost 9.4K followers on Twitch? Uh, my hobby has gotten me th 300 followers. Uh, 9.4K is very impressive for sure. Uh, how long did we use it before it really like took off took off i'd say it really took off took off like during vestige um we sort of cheated in terms of brands in that we did fate a fate campaign and then did a digimon campaign and then mm -hmm. did another fate campaign so we sort of did have hey do you like these other ips come do this before we jumped into here's our ip yeah. um which i call cheating but it's you know the best form of cheating um, yeah, I mean it's and it's not it's not really cheating. Like you're allowed to. You can play in a, a TTRPG actual play in whatever setting you want. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um I actually miss those settings a lot. I don't I just picked up this book at a used at a small local used uh TTRPG store. This is the EverQuest player's handbook. Oh, that's so cool. And, and a whole yeah, bunch of I mean, others. Yeah, I'm really excited to get into that. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um but I think um it's hard to say because we were using fantasy grounds like i said right from like session four yeah of, uh i guess i guess a, a way to sum up the the question is, is just like how long were you going before it really started uh blowing I up and growing as a stream probably like four years Ooh. um i hate to make anything good out of covid but i think i think covid sort of uh, people needed stuff to watch yeah and we started vestige basically as soon as covid happened mm -hmm. like i remember Ka carrie and i were dating at the time and we were coming back from scotland and i remember getting the first art back from our artist at the time for vestige You'd be like Woo! and then two months later covid <laughs> um yeah it's f digression by the way fun fact I, uh for those of you that watch you may have heard the story before Vestige initially dealt with amniasis, a disease that was would rob people of their memories and traveled via miasma and contact with blood. Um, and there is a reason the early game sort of slowly pivoted away from amniasis, and it had a lot to do with not wanting to deal with a magical pandemic emotionally in game. Yeah, uh, that that would be. That I wonder what I wonder what your show would look like if you if you'd stuck to that. I think that I don't think it would have hurt it, but I know that I uh, we I think I don't, I don't mean like, I, I don't uh, like viewers. I mean like for you all as players, like how oh, would that have affected you? I think it would be a lot more bleak, especially given what Amniasis did. I'm actually ready because Amniasis is like a big theme in the mm. setting right now. Um, I'm actually ready to start telling stories in the setting that dive more into that. But we definitely were like, yeah, memory disease, the, the, the amniasis, the, the amniotic miasma. Tournament arc, though. We could do a tournament arc and have an anime-style tournament arc for 30 episodes. And that sounds fun. Let's that does sound fun. That sounds way more fun, honestly. I, I, I also think that tournament arc is where people really... Uh, I recall viewership getting really invested because that arc was a way to deliver a lot of lore and setting and mm -hmm. cool characters. People And people um, just love a tournament arc. And I think that the way that we structured it was really good because it wasn't just people fighting. There was a lot of twists and there was 
there was like strong rivalries mm-hmm. and like thematic encounters and a lot of outside fight like oh if you lose this then your girlfriend's soul outside is dead and just a lot of a lot more than just the fighting which is what you yeah. want in something like that yes absolutely uh, but yeah everyone everyone loves a good tournament arc so yeah maybe that's the tip run a tournament arc run a tournament arc if you think you can make sure you have a beach episode in the middle though <laughs> players have been asking me for it we did it we did a beach non-canon beach game after our tight moon game where i don't know if if you know about tight moon but for those that do know all the servants were beach themed and all the combat was volleyball and (laughs) and, uh, so i think i think what you're telling you now you've got to do a canon version of that that is actually like (laughs) delivers like one bit of plot critical information I want to do a beach episode. I want to do a beach episode. I'm just waiting for them to get somewhere not terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we're going to do a beach episode in this frozen hellscape. Yeah. We all get frostbite. (laughs) In this dread plane. Curse of Strahd beach episode. Honestly, it's a good idea. I think I think there is I think there is a uh, there's a whole subgenre of goth music that is specifically uh, surf goth. So I think I think there's a there's a there's a realm where that works. That'd be very Adams family. I yeah. think is like the energy you're aiming for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's everything's gray, the sand is gray, the water's gray. Everyone's in like black or gray bathing suits. Yeah, yeah. Bleak, depressing but still fun <laughs> beach episode. Yeah, they're playing volleyball with the severed head of their rival or something. <laughs> it's so dark. We might have gotten a little too far with this now. <laughs> um, all right. Well, what plans? This is again from Raven Dan. Uh, what plans do you have for the future uh, after the setting guide and following book drops? Any ideas for other setting guides in different parts of uh, Samus Domina? Uh, more lore heavy things or slow buildups? So I do have a lot of plans because uh, our, our setting guide only covers. Um, Retia, one of the three major continents. Mm-hmm. So no, those aren't even the only continents. They're just like the three major ones. Uh, Retia is one of them. The thing is, the setting guide is functional as a setting guide, but because it's a continent, not, not a country, uh, it features like seven countries within it, mm-hmm. each one of which I think could have a setting guide. So there's a lot of um, more finely targeted content I want to make in the future that zooms in on areas mm-hmm. and elaborates on them. I'd love to follow in the the footsteps of like old wizard stuff and do like a uh, like a divine compendium and have a god focused book. I'd love to do one that has like a fey focused book. Um, but those aren't like the big big things. Those are just things I'd like to write on the side. The main things that I have planned are the setting guide, which also includes risk and reward, the companion book that we're Running a Kickstarter for in May, by the way. I'll plug that later if that's cool. Yeah, of course. Um, Absolutely cool. Uh, and uh, the main things I want to do after that are Kahulis, the other major continent, which is the more fey and natural-driven continent that has a strong uh, uh, Gaelic and romantic European and Asian inspiration it's where like all the elves are all the like the long living races are it's less mm-hmm. industrial it's more naturalistic and magical um i want to do one that's focused on that um and then i also want to do a setting guide focused on uh the strike lands which is our fantasy australia it's where everything's bad and all the monsters are big imagine <laughs> a normal monster imagine a giant spider's like our spider and then imagine the australia equivalent of that and that's what that place is like yeah okay <laughs> Honestly, Australia, good good place to be setting a, uh, a an RPG adventure. Yep, and they all got unique stuff because I've the setting is very much not about one thing. Like it's an active world. Our stories deal with singular problems, but the way I world build is very much like yeah, there's empires going like con- con- conflicting with each other in the background. That our story's not about that. We're not going to resolve that, but it's part of the mm-hmm. the flavor. So there's a lot of that stuff I want to cover. Um, I want to do a book about the plains. However. The most urgent thing we have to do after the setting guide is we did say we would write a five level adventure um, Mm -hmm. and produce that as part of our last Kickstarter. So to fulfill that promise, that's the thing we're going to focus on. And we will probably crowdfund to try to have that be as chunky as we can get it. But that uh, a five level adventure probably levels four to nine, something in that area. 
because I think that's where a lot of the meat a lot of people like to play with is. Um, something like that is the the next most immediate plan. Probably that, Kahulis, and then zoom in on something, and then do the strike lands in the future. That's all right. Yeah, and music. Oh, we've been working with uh, some composers to get original music made for our streams, so that we can move away from using um, more copyrighted stuff in yeah. the background. Uh, I'd like to kind of go down that road and um, get soundtracks made and whatnot and produce That's like cool. the sounds of Somnus Domina and whatnot. And they're really, I'm so excited. They've given us stuff back. I can't say much about it because it's a new idea, but yeah, um, but that's still, I'm, that's still cool. That's, that's huge. That's a thing that I feel like is a missed opportunity with a lot of RPGs and even just like setting books is not having something like that. Yeah. Produced for we, it it's it's and we're in a good a lot like how we get a lot of art done i think that's kind of the next logical step is Mm -hmm. getting things like music done because we're really about the set dressing i think with our brand is really about like setting the stage uh and everything around it and then being like play within it but here's all the flavor Mm -hmm. and like i said earlier we do that well uh so i think that's a thing to keep pushing as hard as we can all right interesting Interesting. That's some that's some cool stuff you got on the uh, on the horizon. I think uh, so. So how long is it before we hear about the Nat 19's animated show? It feels like an inevitability <laughs> nowadays, isn't it? So, um, for legal reasons, I can't say the name of who they were, <laughs> but we actually had a deal. And we're one signature away from signing on to make one a long oh. time ago with a company. Okay. Uh, however, I don't. I don't want to build it up too much because that company was terribly mismanaged, uh, and it, it and its basically criminal CEO caused the company to go under. But we were in talks with the company. We were going to get one made, and we were already along the production pipeline of getting assets made for it and putting a team together for it. Um, and then we got to the point where the head of the company <laughs> tried to give us a contract that I was at no stage comfortable with. And I was like, no. And then yeah. they exploded. Well, um, so funny enough, as much as it was probably doomed from the start, uh, we were in you talks never know, about though. doing that. I mean, yeah. I guess with, with, I guess with the, the people backing it might have been doomed, but so maybe yeah. maybe in the future i'm really happy i didn't sign that contract like <laughs> everything about that team and all the people working at that company mm-hmm. was great until everybody found out that the ceo had been embezzling and the company had no money that's that that's you know that put a wrench in some things <laughs> yeah that that usually does but uh yeah i right, i well. left i left before uh, the writing was on the wall because I felt something was wrong and I felt really bad watching it explode from afar. <laughs> I'd love well. to do that, though. Oh, my God, you have no idea. <laughs> um, and then I guess, because uh, we're we're almost out of time, we could probably take one or two more questions if people really quickly drop them in. Uh, but I've got one for you, which is, what do you think makes running a, a TTRPG stream different than just running a TTRPG game. Um, so there's certain etiquettes that you got to keep. For example, reminding your players not to look at the chat. Um, there's certain things that are fun that are like, okay, for the health of the game, nobody gets to... There's certain things that seem fun that you have to be like, guys, we can't do for the health of what we're doing. Um, again, I keep referencing Critical Role. I think they, they learned early on that they can't look at the chat because it detracts from the game even though it's fun to interact uh, at a normal table. You don't have to think about that, right? Yeah. I mean, you're just like, we're playing whatever. Um, there's definitely a certain level of uh, keeping everybody in line. As far as remembering, we are here to perform a little bit more, um, but don't let that get in the way of being genuine. Like don't, don't let that detract from mm. having fun because what most people want to see in a game isn't yeah. a bunch of actors they want to see a bunch of people having fun together and then everything else has to be on top of that. Yes. At a normal table. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of famous cases in the TTRPG space of players at stream tables trying to main character it up and it Mm -hmm. kind of killing things or them getting kicked out or what have you. 
Uh, so you want to avoid that. Uh, there's a certain degree of flair, I think, that goes into it. Um, it's, there's definitely a lot more pressure on the GM than there is at a normal table. Because you can't be like, well, guys, you know what? We're an hour into game today, and you know we're just really not feeling it at this point. Um, I wasn't really prepared for what we were going to do today. So, so can we just like take a two-hour break, and I'll figure out what we're going to do. We'll order a pizza and come back to it. Can't do that on a stream. No. You can, you can end a stream. And if you have a nice fan base, they'll probably be like, no, we care about you. That's fine. But if you want to do well, yeah. regardless of how forgiving your fan base is and your viewers are, you can't do it. You just can't. It just doesn't look good. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of... I did there's have a lot to do more... that once. You did? I did. I did have to do that. Uh, uh, we didn't end it. We paused for five minutes and I really quickly read as quickly as I could. Well, that's definitely... That's cool. I think any 10-minute break is yeah. within reason. But it was because but the you... players like went completely the opposite direction... Like, like, not even, like, a little detour. It was, like, completely opposite of what I had planned. And we got into stuff that I was not prepared to even talk about. Yeah. And then you also need to have much thicker skin, both as players and a GM. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to interact with a fan base, you are oh, inevitably yes. going to interact with people who are very excited. And sometimes, that usually manifests in really nice ways. Yes. And sometimes it manifests in not so nice ways because they are, they're invested. They care mm -hmm. a lot. And so if you do something that sort of goes against their expectations in a, in a bad way, like let's say a character they really love has a big heroic death. And I'm not mm -hmm. pulling from an actual example, but let's say they love one of the player characters a lot and that player character dies. They may have died in the most fair way or they may have died to luck or what have you, mm -hmm. but their emotional reaction may be to be like, I don't like that. You're the GM. You could have said they're OK. I'm mad. And you have to be prepared for those people to never reconcile with what happened. Um, and you sort of have to just be like some people will react that way. And some yeah. people might even leave the stream because they don't agree with a split second thing you maybe had no mm -hmm. control over or everyone liked. And unfortunately, those situations, people do try to tend to turn that into aggression and point yes. it at the players or the GM. And you have to be prepared to, within reason, let that roll off your back and be like, as long as the table is having fun mm -hmm. and as long as we know nothing unfair happened, we need to know that to some degree, this is for us. And we can't let extreme feelings from outside the table taint that. And yes. it's a lot easier said than done. It is but, uh, honestly, it's it's very very hard. Yeah. Um, not to mention, I, I don't want to bring it up too much because I hate talking about negative stuff. But sometimes you just get people that just don't like you. Oh no! Oh, and like that's fine. Oh They're allowed to not like me. <laughs> but <laughs> I am a prickly personality quite often. I I get it. Like, um. I, I, I probably wouldn't like me. <laughs> I'd probably be like, do you, you are so big all the time. Fill in every room. Do you got it? Can you calm down? Step aside. I, that's yeah. probably what I would think of me. People tell me that's not me, but I'm like, I don't know. That's how it feels from inside. Um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's okay not to like people and not to like players and not to like their characters. But, mm -hmm. you know. Um, oh, no, no, phone. I'm not... I'm not, I don't know who that is. Go away. Uh, well, we are uh, pretty much here at the end of our time. Oh. Right? Seven minutes over. Oh, no. It's, it, you know, sometimes I go, sometimes it happens. But sometimes we're good. So, first off, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come and talk to me about streaming and RPGs and everything else. Yeah, this is so fun. No, I'd I'd love to come do this again sometime. And yeah, any anytime, honestly. Yeah, I'd love to to talk more. Like Nat nineteen stuff's cool. I would love to take a, a day sometime to just like talk about running stuff, even without the context of streaming. Because yes, there's just so much to talk about. Between there is, there is. Tables. So honestly, we we should set up another another stream here in the future to uh, yeah. to talk about specifically GMing because I think that's. That's a big part that I, because my background and almost all of my DMing has been streaming, mm -hmm. it's something that I often forget that like, yeah, you can't, you can DM without being a streamer. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, but it yeah. is. It went when, when, when it's your life and it's like all you you've done for years, it is hard to kind of break out and be like, role playing games exist as, as games whole, outside of a stream. 
there's a whole conversation about philosophy. Like, I won't get into it, but I do run some private table games for just friends as well. Which I need and to start I do doing. I'm a different beast between those. Like, the mm-hmm. way I handle games. Like, I, I am way more prone to silly flights of fancy at private games where I'm like, none of this matters. We don't have to prove anything to anyone. So, yeah, yeah, you can... I normally try to say yes, but I, I say hell yes at, in private games, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but again, I won't. We're already over time. No, <laughs> we're we're good. We're good. Um, I'm going to here. I'm going to drop in. You're you can do your plugs here in a minute, um, and I've got some as well. But I'm going to drop in a quick link because I know there was a couple of questions about streaming. Just to remind everybody, I've done uh, three different ones now, but I'm going to drop in the first stream that I did, which was specifically talking about um, how to set up a TTRPG stream. At least how I set mine up. Uh, which might be a little outdated. Maybe I should do an updated version of this here because my setup's changed. Um, but how to set one up using a, a VTT, obviously for this using Fantasy Grounds, but it's it's how I set up everything. It's how I, I set up everyone's audio. It's how we did uh, all of that. So feel free to check out that stream. Um, and there are chapters in it too. So you can just jump to the part that you need. Nice. Um. And monkey, you're always down for some D and D with me. Thank you. Uh, we will. I need to. I need to get my show uh, back going. It's been a. It's been a hot minute since my group kind of fell apart. Oh no! It's the thing that happens when when life happens, and then like oh. one person's like, I can't. I can't make it anymore. This big life event came up, and I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. And then everyone else is like, Also, coincidentally, we also have big life events. Darn life! If only life could stop happening. I wish. I wish I could just pause life. And focus on role playing games. Yep, uh, isn't that the ideal? It, oh. it sure is. Um, but anyway, you wanna you wanna plug all of your stuff, and I think okay. our, our moderator left, so I'm gonna try to get the links posted for you. So uh, the main things is um, Nat19 official on Twitch, I believe. Look up Nat19 on Twitch; you'll find us. We're the only one with Nat19 in our name that has the the a substantial amount of followers. Uh, also not 19 on youtube the main thing i want to plug right now uh if i can and if i throw a link in chat is it gonna um let is... me let me quickly what is your uh what account are you using and i'll get you marked probably the not ni- probably the not 19 one okay. not 19 official then keep talking and i'll get you a vip so we ran our we ran our kickstarter at the start of the year raised two hundred thousand dollars which has basically all gone into the production of our our stuff uh, however the book got too big to the point where i'm worried about the spine of it so we split the book into the physical book that's about 700 pages and then the bestiary magic items and whatnot that will be available to everyone who supported it as a pdf however uh we want to print that second book as well and want to open chances to get the first book again so we're running another kickstarter starting may 1st uh for what is called lyra costilla chandonet's guide to risk and reward um and if we could i would love to if i have the go to put a link in Maybe if I do that, there we go. Uh, I can follow that link in the chat. Look for it on Kickstarter if you want. Uh, you should be able to find it with just go on to Kickstarter, look up uh, Guide to Risk and Reward, and you should find it. It's got a big mech as its uh, thumbnail. If you want to follow that, you can get the PDFs for it. Start at a $30 Canadian tier. You can purchase copies of the book, the, of the major book we're going to be printing. You can get limited edition covers only available through the Kickstarter. And there's dice and there's cards and there's peripheral tools and all sorts of other things. Uh, we're just trying to get money to do a print run of the second book, but we'd love to take it further. So that's the main thing. You want to check it out? Go check that out. Please and thank you. We'd appreciate it so much. Awesome. Perfect. Any anything else you wanna you wanna drop in there? We stream right now. We're finishing up our Devil May Cry based game that's coming to an end. That's we stream that on Saturdays at one p.m. PST. Mm-hmm. Um, and once that's done in late May, we're gonna start our Gilligan's Grave game, which is a Somnus Domina game, the setting that we make. Mm-hmm. Uh, also one p.m. PST. Jump in on us with that. It's got some fun players. Uh, got a new player and some of our cast. Um, and we're really going to be trying to show off what makes the setting sort of fun in that particular one uh beyond that we stream on thursdays we have gaming streams that our cast does throughout the entire week so if you follow us on twitch and you want to just jump in usually around 5 p.m pst every day a few hours of whatever game the people Mm -hmm. that day are playing 
Um, and uh, on Drive Through RPG, look up Logan Laidlaw. You can find all my stuff. And that's, I think, all I have to plug, really. Perfect. Perfect. Well, hey, everyone. We've come to the end of our time here for Fantasy Grounds Fridays. Uh, but don't worry, the show happens every single Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time or whatever time that is for you personally. For me, it is uh, noon mountain time. Gotta love that that underused uh, time zone. Uh, but don't worry, if you want to catch the show, uh, all of these are permanently saved onto our YouTube channel. Uh, you can just find us by searching Fantasy Grounds. Um, you can find all of these episodes and more tons of uh, interviews and just other things. Sometimes I talk about streaming. Sometimes we interview authors and there's all kinds of good stuff. Um, and we've got some really cool authors lined up in the future that I think you'll all uh, really like to hear from. Um, so yeah, we'll be back next Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we're probably going to go drop a raid if there's somebody else doing uh, something with Fantasy Grounds right now. But before... We run on and do that. I wanted to shout out to uh, the Fallout TV show just released. And for those that don't know, we oh, yeah. have the Fallout 2D20 role-playing game on Fantasy Grounds. If you're interested for a limited time until, let me triple check, I think May 13th, we're running a uh, Fallout Complete Bundle, um, which is the Fallout 2D20. Uh, it's all the books for the Fallout 2D20 game uh we're calling it the vault 33 bundle and you can get it at a 33 percent discount yeah so grab that and if you haven't played fallout 2d20 or any uh modifius 2d20 system it is so cool and honestly really easy to use and the fantasy grounds version of it is super super streamlined and just amazing to use um dominic the dev who worked on it did just an absolutely amazing job um, I ran one game or two games technically one of them was while we were testing one of them was a stream and it was amazing highly recommend you check it out um, and you beyond that let me just triple check if those people that are streaming right now are uh, using <laughs> fantasy grounds but I believe they are <laughs> um, you got any you got anything you want to add while we, uh, while we wrap prepare up? this uh uh, this was a lot of fun. I've been a big fan of Fantasy Grounds for a long time, and it's uh, cool to actually touch base with the community. I gotta We've say, been a fan of you for a long time. Oh, oh stop it! All right, oh. we're gonna go drop our raid over on Gorath Gaming. Um, doing some. I can't actually tell what rule set he's playing. It's, but uh, doing something with Fantasy Grounds, some TTRPG. Let's uh, let's go hang out over there. Uh, show them the love and. We'll catch you next time and make sure you go check out the nat 19 show yeah. uh, what time is your show again on saturdays is 1 p.m pst on thursdays it is 5 p.m pst um and then you, there's stuff going on all through the week uh usually around 5 p.m pst usually perfect go check them out they're a lot of fun yeah i like us <laughs> we like you too <laughs> bye everybody <laughs> <laughs>